Uh, this morning, I have Dr. William Reed. Um, Dr. Reed, I saw a story about him and the baby trip probably two years ago, and I've had a sticky note in my desk for two years. I had actually looked up his phone number in this thing called a phone book, and it worked. He answered. And so um, when I got a text um, late last week asking who my speaker was, and I gave him a call, and he uh, graciously agreed to, uh, to uh, speak to us today. Dr. Reed wrote a book called A Dark Night in Aurora about the shooter at the Navy Theater in Aurora, Colorado. Um, and I'm really interested to see what he has to say. So please help me welcome Dr. William Reed. Thank you, Taylor. Thanks a lot. Um, I'm Bill Reed to anybody, uh, anybody talking to me, honest to goodness. And would somebody please order me two eggs over easy, grits and potatoes and a big cinnamon roll? Can you hear me? <laughs> that usually yeah, gets loud. Okay. Um, I understand that I'm a last minute choice here, uh, sort of like being in the in the uh, remainder bin for Rotary, but I like that. That's just fine. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here, and I want to thank uh, uh, Gil Jones, uh, Judge, for uh, for setting up the the uh, Zoom for me. Um, you'll probably expect me to kind of advertise the book. Um, I will hold it up one time. Uh, this is the hardback. This is the paperback. I'm not holding up the ebook or the audio book. You can order it on Amazon or go to Barnes and Noble, pretty much any bookstore and, uh, and get it. Um, if you don't have anything else to do with your money. I recommend donating to charity instead, uh, but that's that's up to you. Uh, I'm a psychiatrist. For the last 20 years, I've specialized in forensic psychiatry. That is not about psychiatry on dead people. I've gotten that question more than once. Uh, it's work at the interface of mental health uh, and the law. Sometimes it involves criminal cases. Sometimes it involves civil cases like lawsuits. I frequently tell people that it, it is nothing like the TV show Bull. If you've seen that show, <coughs> Bull is entertaining, but it's, uh, it's pretty much a fairy tale. And the star is a psychologist. Nothing wrong with psychologists, but a psychologist rather than a psychiatrist. I work with lawyers and with courts and judges pretty much all around the U.S., um, I'm a professor at, at some medical schools here in Texas. I'm on the board over at Shriner University. I will encourage all of you to send your kids and grandkids to Shriner. I'm supposed to do that. Uh, I write uh, books. I've written 16 or 17. Watch for my new novel coming out in about a year. I play the guitar. I play old style blues in sleazy bars. Come see me on the 20th at uh, the club in Fredericksburg. Don't tell them I said it's a sleazy bar. It's not a sleazy bar. They just pay that way. Anyway, um, sometimes I work on mass killing cases. Various law enforcement agencies and the FBI, et cetera, define mass killing as two or three people uh, being killed or wounded in the same event. I've done several dozen of those over the years. Some of them have involved a dozen or more victims in the same event, um, and some far more than that. The case in Aurora, uh, the one in the book, the Aurora, Aurora the, a cinema there, um, had 70 victims in, in the one incident. This morning, I can talk about the book if you want me to. I can talk about the case. I've got more photos about the case that I can put up on the screen here. I can talk about the perpetrator, James Holmes. I spent a lot of time with him, interviewed him for 23 hours. Um, I, can, I can talk about uh, the trial, the investigations, about mass killings in general, or I can just tell you what people like me, forensic psychiatrists, uh, do for a living. It's probably best to let you guys uh, decide the topic and kind of start out with, with questions and get the discussion started, because then things will go the about things that you want to hear or you want to ask about. Um, if there aren't any questions, I can talk at you. I, I teach a lot. 
I promise it'll be more boring. Uh, your choice. So anybody have any particular topic or question that they would like to kick things off with about uh, the Aurora killing, about mass, mass shootings, trial investigation, anything like that? I think the consensus here is um, talk about the shooter. About the shooter. <coughs> no problem. Um, the shooter in Aurora was a guy named James Holmes. He started out life as an average kid. His parents were well-educated, middle-class folks. His dad has a, a either a master's or a PhD, I'm not recalling. As he went through school, he kept to himself a little bit, but, but nothing, nothing unusual at all. Didn't get in trouble with the law. No particular indications of serious mental illness couple of family counseling things because family moved around. He was an extremely good student. Uh, he went to university uh, and applied to graduate school in the neurosciences. When he applied to graduate school, when you apply to graduate school, some of you may know, you usually have to, to write a little essay or say something about yourself. And the essay that he wrote was uh, unusual. Hello. Did everybody else hear that echo? <laughs> yeah. Hang on a second. Uh, okay. Just as people have The um uh, the essay that he wrote was bizarre and none of the graduate schools offered him a, a graduate position. Uh, his grades were fine. Everything else, his test scores were outstanding. He eventually, after working, uh, after living at home for a year and working in, in a pill coating factory, uh, was offered two positions one at the graduate school of the University of Illinois and the other at the graduate school at the University of Colorado um, in their neuroscience division. The University of Illinois is extremely lucky that he didn't choose them. He went to, uh, he went to Denver, uh, Denver area. He did okay in graduate school the first year. He was considered an odd duck. Um, he had some friends, uh, no indication of anything violent or anything like that. Um, liked video games, but not the violent ones. Interestingly, more than one professor in their evaluations of him said he was an odd duck. But that was okay because he was in graduate school. And a lot of scientists are kind of odd people, so they didn't mind that at all. Around the end of his first year, he began to he began to talk with a counselor. He talked with a girlfriend, really the only girlfriend he'd ever had, about thoughts of killing people. And she recommended he go see a counselor, and he went to see a counselor and was referred to a psychiatrist. That psychiatrist brought in a second psychiatrist who was an expert in violence because he was talking about killing people. Turned out he'd begun to have thoughts like that since he was a little kid, but hadn't shared them with anybody. They'd been vague <coughs> when he was 10, 11 years old had gotten more specific, more violent. And by the time he saw the psychiatrists late in his first year of graduate school, he was very careful about talking with the psychiatrists. He saw him half a dozen times and did not <coughs> that would give him for hospitalizing him against his will. In the U.S. and pretty much every state, uh, getting into the hospital is actually hard. 
even if you want to nowadays, because it's so darn expensive. But getting into the hospital against your will, being committed, if you will, requires that a person be pretty much imminently dangerous uh, or <coughs> absolutely unable to take care of themselves or dangerous to themselves. The psychiatrists did not hear anything that made him committable. And I do not fault them at all. They got sued after the, after the event and the suit was, was dismissed. I know one of them fairly well by now. Anyway, goes to the psychiatrist. Pretty soon he broke up with his girlfriend and said, um, you don't want to be associated with me. <clears throat> he had been by that time, and we're talking about late spring of his first graduate school year, amassing weapons and making plans, writing them down uh, in what he called his notebook. I can show you some pages from that in a minute, if you like. And buying things like handguns, long guns, ammunition, incendiary materials, uh, body, body protection, body armor, things like that. He thought about killing people in airports or somewhere else. He carefully thought out where he could kill the most people in a short time without being killed himself. He didn't care too much about being killed himself, but he wanted to kill the more, most people he could uh, first. His view of killing those people was interesting. It was not revenge. It was not um, for any of the usual purposes that people commit crimes or kill people. He wasn't particularly angry at them. He had an odd idea that he could get points for killing people. And if he killed one person, he got a point. If he killed three people, he got three points. The points did not have any particular value. It was like keeping score in a video game, for example. They didn't have any particular value, uh, but he wanted to get lots of points. He drew some things out like that in, in the notebook that he created over a period of, of several weeks. He decided on uh, the Century Theater in Aurora, Colorado. He cased it pretty well, decided which auditorium in that theater would be the best for his purpose, figured out a way to lock the exit doors at the top of the theater, the, the, the back, uh, with some, some handcuffs, actually. He never did that, but he figured out a way to do it. Um, figured out where he would stand, where the people would be running, uh, things like that. He interestingly did not want to kill children. So he looked for a movie that was a midnight movie or a late movie. And that turned out to be the premiere of one of the Batman uh, movies. It was going to be shown at midnight. He got his ticket online in advance, things like that. A lot of folks in the media talk about him as sort of a Batman killer, the Joker. And he got the nickname, the Joker, uh, in jail. Actually, he had, he had none of that. That was not his purpose. That wasn't his idea. That was all pretty much media hype. Um, he took a picture of his weapons laid out on the bed, and I can show you that picture if you like. Uh, then on the night that this was to occur, he set up his apartment as a trap, as a, he set it up so that if anyone entered the apartment, it would go up in flames, he said, to divert the police from the theater. Um, all kinds of incendiary things, and I can show you some pictures of that if you like. And he played loud music so that somebody would be likely to knock on the door and go in. He also did some other things to encourage people to go in and set the whole apartment building, the apartment and the building aflame. 
Uh, fortunately, no one ever did that. And that setup was, was preserved so that the, the bomb squad uh, dismantled it, took lots of pictures of it. <coughs> he put on, <coughs> excuse me, he put on his regalia, body armor, upper and lower, um, neck protector, things like that, <coughs> helmet, goggles, <coughs> and a gas mask. The, and he went to um, the theater, parked his Hyundai in back. He had previously <coughs> gone to the theater and put a device, a little clip, on the exit door to hold it open so that he could go in through the exit door. He went in to begin with, <coughs> bought his ticket and everything, looking normal. I, I shouldn't have, I, I misspoke a little, area, a little earlier. He went in to begin with, got his ticket at the kiosk with his, with his phone, went in, then with some kind of pretext, went out the exit door, put the clip on the door to keep it open, went to his car and put on all of his body armor and, and got his weapons. He went back in just after the movie started. And the first thing he did was toss a tear gas grenade uh, into, the, into the audience, into the, into the theater. Initially, people thought that was just a trick or associated with the movie. Somebody's setting off a firecracker or something like that. Turned out to be tear gas. And then he started shooting. He was wearing a gas mask, but he could see well through the gas mask. I've experimented with similar weapons and similar gas masks and things like that to, to determine that. And so did, so did the law enforcement people, investigative people. First thing he did was empty a uh, Remington uh, shotgun, uh, five shots, dropped it on the floor. Uh, he had two Glock handguns, emptied one of those. He had an m p 15 rifle, which is a civilian copy of an AR-14, which is perfectly legal. He had bought these things quite legally. He ordered them online so people wouldn't, you know, and a little at a time, so people wouldn't get too suspicious. Began to shoot with that. He had two banana clip magazines. Um with 30 rounds each. When one of them jammed, he, he had he'd shot thousands of rounds of ammunition in practice in the mountains in Colorado at a, a state uh, uh, shooting range. But he really didn't know how to do it in terms of changing the, the magazines very well. He overloaded one of the magazines and it jammed. He went up one of the aisles to try to fix it underneath one of the lights, one of the light sconces, and was unsuccessful. By this time, he had wounded 70 people, or he had wounded 58 people, and killed 12, or at least 12 eventually died. Uh, some of them had been kind of herded as he planned, herded into one part of the theater, trying to get out. Uh, the weapon jammed. He decided that was over. And he walked out, walked back to his car and began to take off his regalia. One child was killed, a little child who had been brought uh, with the family. Uh, he asked about that child after he got arrested. He was taking off his regalia when two of the officers who by then had, had showed up uh, saw him. They thought he was a cop at first because he was wearing the protective stuff like a SWAT team person, sort of. Uh, but they soon realized he wasn't. He surrendered immediately, was very quiet, did not resist. Um, they checked him out thoroughly and all that and, and took him to, uh, to one, of the, uh, one of the stations. In his interrogation, he was quiet, pretty much emotionless. He did ask if there had been any children hurt or killed. And I'm not, I think they told him that they didn't know at that point. 
Um, we have lots of video of him sitting there in a torn t-shirt, which is about all he had left after they took off his other uh, stuff. He <coughs> didn't deny anything. Uh, at some point he asked for a lawyer, but there was a lot of interrogation before he asked for a lawyer. In the investigation that followed, uh, it was oh, one of the things he did do was he helped the police to dismantle the stuff at his apartment. They said, do you really want to kill children in the apartment building? And he helped them by telling them what was going on. Uh, they told him how to fix the trip wire, for example, on the front door so it wouldn't pour a container of uh, glycerin into a dish of potassium permanganate. That may mean nothing to you, but when you mix glycerin and potassium permanganate, a very hot reaction happens. And the, uh, the apartment was full of uh, explosives and, and uh, perfectly legally purchased explosives, uh, things like that, gasoline, stuff like that. In due course, his lawyers uh, decided to try an insanity defense, which was really the only thing they could try because he was absolutely caught uh, and Colorado has a death penalty. Um, the ins in the course of that, over the next year or two, uh, both the defense and the prosecution got psychiatrists and experts and psychologists to work with the insanity defense or work against the insanity defense in the case of the prosecution. Uh, <clears throat> very soon after that, the judge, a judge, Samur, <coughs> excuse me, who in my view is a very good judge. As a matter of fact, he's now in the Colorado Supreme Court. <coughs> decided, the judge decided he wanted his own expert and eventually hired two. Uh, I was the outside one, there was another inside one. And we worked with, gathered information from everybody in sight. And three years after the shooting, there was a trial. He was found not to be insane. Colorado has a kind of an arcane way of dealing with that. But in the end, he was found not to be insane. And I testified that I didn't think he was insane either um, and was convicted. I mean, like a quick diversion, let's get to some questions. The legal version of insane for purposes of criminal trial is not the same uh, as are you mentally ill or do you have a serious mental illness? The legal version is if you have a mental illness, does it truly interfere with whether with, with knowing right from wrong? And the fact is, yes, he was a sick puppy as one of my colleagues said, but he absolutely knew what he was doing was wrong. He knew that society would not like it. He knew that the people wouldn't want to be killed. All kind of questions like that. And the jury found him guilty. He came within one vote of the jury of getting the death penalty, which by the way, he probably never would have been executed. Colorado will do away with the death penalty very soon. They're, they've become a very liberal state. And the jury gave him the longest uh, prison sentence in history. Uh, I think it's 24 life without parole and another 3,000 some odd years on top of that. He, uh, he went to prison, was assaulted at least once in prison, was transferred to another prison, <coughs> and now resides in a federal prison uh, on an exchange program, resides in a federal prison uh, in Pennsylvania. That's the end of that part. Somebody ask another question. And I promise to be shorter. Dr. Reed, what, what was your actual role? You were the judge's expert, is that correct? Yes. It, it's. It's a pretty luxurious role for somebody like me. Most of the time, as, as those of you who are attorneys or judges in the room know, most of the time, forensic psychiatrists get retained by a lawyer or by an, an agency of some sort. 
in this case, and it happens occasionally with me, mostly because I've been in the, in the profession for a long time, the judge wanted his own expert to be available to either side, but to not be um, retained by the defense or retained by the prosecution. I like to think that we're a pretty ethical bunch and just being retained by one side or the other doesn't mean that we lie or something like that. So I had the luxury of act, very good access to, to both sides in the case. The office you see behind me had 20 or 30 bankers boxes of records, about 85,000 pages, um, discs and discs of video and DVD. Uh, I spent 23 hours interviewing him over I think nine interviews in both prison and a forensic hospital that I asked him to take him to for some of the interviews. Um, but that, that was my role. Eventually the report that I wrote and both sides read and the judge read suggested that I would be much more useful to the prosecution than to the defense. And indeed the prosecution called me to testify um, there were other psychiatrists involved. Uh, one was a very well-known expert in schizophrenia, which Holmes probably has. Uh, unfortunately, she wasn't a forensic psychiatrist, and she had a tough time testifying because she was trying to put everything in psychiatric language when courts and juries are trying to listen to things in the language of the court. Hope that answers that. So what was your diagnosis? Diagnosis? Um, that's a really good question. At the time that, and, and the point of my work, or people like me work, is what was the person's mental state at the time of the event? Not six years before, not three years after. At the time, he was clearly mentally ill but I did not believe that he had a diagnosis such as schizophrenia, which is the one where you, you may not know what's going on, not know what reality is. Most of the time you do, but part of the time you don't. As time went by, this is kind of interesting, in, in, the, in the jail as he awaited trial, it took three years to get him to trial, he had what we would call a psychotic break. That is, he became pretty darn crazy. Um, and they put him in a, a special room to, quote, protect him. It turns out that it was a, a, a terribly cruel room, actually. And I'll mention that in just a second. But uh, now I believe he does have schizophrenia. But still, I believe he was responsible for his actions. And that's the question that the court has to answer, that the jury has to answer. The room, interestingly, he was in a cell which is relatively comfortable. When he began to act odd, they were afraid he might kill himself. They put him in a room that was absolutely bare with no furnishings at all, stripped naked with what's called a suicide blanket and a suicide shift that you can't tear up and hang yourself with it. There is no uh, toilet in the room. There is a drain, a drain in the center with a grate, and that's your toilet. Uh, I'm not sure how anybody would stay sane in that. But um, he got crazier and crazier in that room. All this was videoed, by the way. Video was always on him. And um, eventually was taken to hospital, was given medication finally, uh, and then went back to his, to his regular cell. At the trial, he was absolutely silent, as, as most criminal defendants are. The audience in the trial couldn't see that he was shackled to the floor during the trial, <coughs> but he was. <clears throat> the only time he spoke was when the judge asked him if he had anything to say. And he said no. And that was on, on advice of his counsel, probably. 
he didn't really mind if he got the death note. Um, I don't think he wanted it, but we talked a lot about that. It didn't matter very much to him. It mattered to his parents. They were in the, in the courtroom uh, every day. Um, let me see if I can show you a couple of pictures of some of the stuff that, that might be fun. Uh, no, no, nothing about this is fun. We have um, about five minutes. Five, oh, thank you for telling me that. Um, can you guys see that picture? Yes. yes. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. That's a picture he took of his bed. You can see uh, the Remington shotgun in the upper right. It is a tactical shotgun, but not much different from a bird hunting gun. Um, all the magazines, the gas masks, the handguns, the MP15 assault rifle, things like that. He was proud of that. And he wrote in one, in one uh, uh, comment that he wanted to be known as competent uh, in masculine things, what he saw as masculine things. I'm trying to think of the exact words there in the book. It turned out he was not particularly competent in it. Um, let's see if I can change some things here. This is the theater sometime after the shooting. He entered, you're, you're looking pretty much as he would have been. Um, and that, that's not particularly interesting picture was what the theater looked like inside afterward. This is from his Dr. notebook. Go ahead, please. Yeah. Uh, was he a, a violent video game player? No. And that's a fine question, too. He was very good at video games, but they were role-playing video games, not what are called first-person shooters. And that was, uh, that was important to find out. The, <clears throat> the little drawing on the bottom of the page there is his logo. Um, it's a circle with an infinity symbol and a one. He had a word for that. I forgot what it is. Um, this is just a tiny part of his apartment. The picture is taken by uh, a, a uh, uh, explosive team robot, which sneaked in through the door and very carefully set that little container vertical so that the bottle of glycerin inside would not spill anything into the frying pan, which is at the bottom of the picture. I, sorry, I don't have a, a picture of the whole, the whole uh, room there. There are, by the way, there are eight or nine pages of pictures in the book if you should try to get it, or maybe it's at the, probably at the library, I think. This is one of the pages of his notebook where he is figuring out where and how to do his, uh, to do his shooting to kill the most people. He lists pros and cons of different kinds of places. Uh, if you, you probably can't read it from there, but it says three plans of attack. Start at 12, start at 10, uh, things like that. <coughs> as crazy as the tragic event was, it was clear that it had been planned and he knew exactly what he was doing. Um, and the fact that he kept it secret, the fact that he had escape plans, even though he didn't use them, things like that made it clear that he knew it was a criminal act. And that's what got him convicted as contrasted with being found not guilty by reason of insanity. By the way, when people are found not guilty by reason of insanity in cases like this, it's, it's a complicated situation, but they don't just go free. Most people found not guilty by reason of insanity of lesser crimes spend more time off the streets 
in psychiatric facilities than they would spend in jail or prison if they'd been convicted. It is not a common defense. In the case of murders, of course, it, it is tried more often. It is not successful very often. Sometimes it is, and you frequently see that in, in the news. But um, it doesn't mean you go to the hospital for a week and then get out. Let's see. Okay. Doctor, I'm afraid we're out of time. I understand. I understand completely. Um, I really appreciate you having me today. I wish you well in your endeavors. And I'm, it's wonderful that y'all belong to the, the Rotary and work your membership and live your membership. Thank you for having me. Well, thank you for being here. Very interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Very interesting. Bye. Thank you. Yeah, that was very interesting. Okay. Good program, David. Excellent. Okay, so uh, we have anything uh, else that we need to discuss for the good or early? Nothing. All right. We'll, we'll, we'll have to uh, use our imaginations for four-way tests. See you right there. You'll join me in the four-way test. Bring the <laughs> 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 Will be an official ball concern. Will be a